So now this is uh, Nikita Corton. He's going to uh, talk about defaults, defaults. So hello, everyone. And thank you for joining me here today. My name is Nikita Cortin. I'm a software engineer and a security researcher. And well, when I'm not researching or developing anything, usually you can find me training in street workout calisthenics. For example, in this picture, I'm doing Eiffel handstand in front of an Eiffel Tower here in Vegas. And today, I want to share with you some work I did in the field of the research of Android permissions, which I call defaults, defaults, as I found how to bypass different permissions from different protection level, actually from, multi, from all protection levels, using just default services in Android. So first of all, a little bit of uh, statistics. At the moment I was making this presentation, I looked in the Google for the last uh, statistical data. I found that Android holds 72% of the market share of Android in the world, uh, sorry, market share of all smartphones in the world, which is a little less than they have in the previous years, but the absolute number of smartphones increased so much that this is actually more than they have previously. Android OS has 32 distributions, or as it's called officially, API levels, and it runs on over 3 billion active devices. 3 billion. Think about it. This is me, by the way, trying to imagine how 3 billion active devices looks like. So you can why it's important? You can imagine that everything that is happening in Android, every technique that works there, every bug, has a very huge impact. Because of the nature of Android, um, there is no like, you know, particular version or a particular device model that dominates the world completely. Uh, instead, it's distributed across multiple API levels, multiple device models. But if, even if you take like one particular combination of version and device model, you will, let's say that has 1%, still 1% of that is tens of millions. So this is how the impact is heavy. So let's dive into permission mechanism. Now, because there were a lot of changes in the permission mechanism in the last few years, I'm trying to focus in this presentation in the most solid concepts. So first of all, uh, all Android permissions can be divided into three permission types or categories, if you wish. First, it's install time permissions. Now, install time permissions basically permission that enabled uh, right after the application is installed on the device. So you can say that the allowance of this permission is the action of installation. Above that, there is a runtime permission from dangerous protection level. And as the name suggests, uh, this permission protect the more dangerous abilities, the more uh, serious resources. Such a permission, it is not uh, enabled right after application is installed on the device. Instead, a uh, application needs to check whether uh, the permission that allows it to do the, you know, the access, the ability it needs, or the resource is allowed at that particular moment at runtime. And if not, then it will trigger the built-in alert where the user can either allow this permission or deny. And to be even more precise, actually there is like smaller category in that uh, of very few permissions, for example, location permission. In that case, when uh, the alert is triggered, then user can not just uh, allow or deny the permission, but also allow for one-time usage. Anyway, above that, there is the top highest protection level called special system permissions. And this is like very unique and very rare permissions. They're intended for uh, system level interaction and their job is to protect the most powerful actions. And for that reason, it cannot be uh, 
you know, allowed from the application context. The users actually need to go outside of the application uh, context to the advanced settings and uh, enable th this permission for that particular application explicitly in advanced settings. Now, from the API perspective, all permissions that application wants to use from all protection levels must to be declared in manifest, which is basically an XML file. Now, in this example, you can see a list of uh, different permissions that the application uh, used. So some of them from a normal protection level, some of them from a dangerous protection level, and some from special system permission. But you can see that all of them appear uh, in the Android manifest. If they are not declared, they cannot be used at all. This is like the most basic thing in the permission uh, mechanism. Now, because of that, since all the permissions that application is using must be declared in manifest, that makes it very easy to manage and very easy to check uh, which permissions are used. This is how, when you are uploading your application to Google Play Store, Google Play Store know which permissions are used. Or when the application is installed on the device, this is how Play Protect can uh, scan, extract the uh, manifest, and know exactly which permissions are used. And Obviously, any other security external tool uh, doing exactly the same thing. So before you download the app, you can see which permissions are used. For example, in this screenshot, we can see that this uh, application is using this list of permissions. And obviously, the more permissions the application is using, or the higher protection level of these permissions uh, are, basically it means that this application can do more things the more things it can do, it's more privileged. But everything I said until now, this is just the documented part. Now, the undocumented part ahead. Below all that, there is something I call default protection level or default permissions. It's not an official name for that. It's just the way I call it. But the idea is that default permissions is basically all these magical permissions which you, you don't need to declare anywhere. You don't need to get approval from the user. They're just there. You just need to know how to use them. And today I'm going to show you how to use such default permissions to bypass and get the access for resources and abilities that are protected by real permissions. So first example is a, a permission from a normal protection level called internet permission. As the name suggests, internet permission is protecting the access for the internet. So if you want to send URL request, then you obviously need internet permission. You cannot do it without it. So I created a few video recordings to explain every concept. Uh, so how we can understand the setup. Here we can see the Android device. I'm using a virtual Android device just the for simplicity of the presentation. Obviously, the same things can work on the real devices as well. So here we can see the logs of the Android and the code. In this setup, I created basically small Node.js server, which will uh, receive the request from the Android and then respond with some random number. This is how we can see that the basically POC idea, just to prove the concept that it works. So let's see the video. Uh, something is happening, Android is sending request, we can see it in the logs, uh, and some random number, uh, which we can see also in logs of the server, right, was received from the server by the Android. And why it worked? This is the normal behavior, why it worked? Because the application has internet permission. Makes sense, nothing special. So what will happen when the application is attempting to access something that is protected with permission. In this case, exactly the same thing without the permission. In that case, uh, application is crashing. We see this uh, built-in alert. And why it happened? Because there is a security exception. We can see it here. Permission denied. You don't have the needed permission to perform this action. As you can see, I removed it from the manifest. No permissions at all. But now let's see the bypass. Again, the same setup, Android virtual device, Android logs, and server-side logs. So something is happening. We can see logs from both sides. There is a, a communication. We can see the prints on the Android logs. The request was sent. 
from the Android, as we can see it here. It's coming from here. And when we can see the random number that also received uh, from the server by the Android. And we can see the secret, secret string, which I sent from the Android to the server side. So two-way internet communication worked. And this is the Node.js server code. We can see how the data is received and how I created the random number. Very simple code. And in addition to that, I also send scheme AAA and host BBB params, which also received by the server. And why I did that? Because this is the custom URI configurations of my application under the category browsable. And we can see here that this POC works without permissions at all. Okay? So how did it work? I use implicit intent, which is a default service with default action view. And in Android, when you are creating uh, implicit intent with the default action, you basically give the Android ability to decide who is the receiving component. And how it does it? It basically checks the URI. So I'm abusing this functionality, and I'm giving the URI of a default deep link format of Chrome browser, and I'm injecting the URL inside the URI, which basically triggered the browser to send the request for me. And then I received the data back using exactly the same technique, but vice versa, because I'm giving the custom URI configuration of my own application when it's sent to the server. So how I created the payload? I basically downloaded the uh, Chrome APK, uh, extracted the manifest. I can see there the unique scheme, Google Chrome. So I can know how to trigger Chrome browser to open an Android. Then I looked in the uh, decompiled code, and I found the implementation of that. So I can see that scheme Google Chrome with the host navigate receives a query param URL. So we can inject URL inside the URI, and that will trigger the browser to send the request. So this is how I'm creating the payload URI with Google Chrome scheme, host navigate, takes the query param URL. This is my URL. I'm giving the address of my Node.js server with the additional query params, scheme AAA and host BBB. Obviously, it can be anything else. It's just for the simplicity of presentation. But as you can see, this is the custom URI configuration of my application under category browsable. Now, category browsable basically means that this link can be triggered from the browser. The browser can uh, communicate back to the application. So the Node.js server receives the request, extracts the scheme and host from the request, and uses to create the dynamically link on that web page, and then use JavaScript to trigger this link. So let's see the whole flow over a diagram to make it completely clear. Application is sending implicit intent with the Chrome URI that is wrapping our custom URI. Android API recognized the Chrome URI and open the browser, the Chrome browser. Chrome browser extracting the URL from the URI and sending the URL request to our server. Server receiving the request, processing the request, unwrap the custom URI from it and creates the URI link dynamically on that web page and then use the JavaScript to trigger the browser to use this link, which goes back to the Android API that checks who is the receiving component, and the receiving component is, again, our application. And this is how I have the two-way internet communication without internet permission at all. Pretty cool, right? Thank you. Next. Uh, system alert window permission. This permission is coming from the top highest uh, protection level, special system permissions. This uh, permission is very unique. It is intended for a system level interaction with the user. And what it allows you to do is create an overlay that will appear above any app and above any view uh, in the system. So you can imagine why it uh, consider highly sensitive because for example, there is, let's say, a Gmail screen, and you can create your own screen of a Gmail and, you know, cover it completely. 
or cover a part of it, for example. Now, like I explained in the beginning, uh, every permission must be declared in the manifest which application is using. So this is how any security tool can you know, scan the application and know which permissions are used. So all of these tools, they are very much aware of the permission mechanism. So obviously they know exactly which permissions are the most privileged ones. So if such a privileged permission appears there, they detect it immediately and the suspiciousness of this application automatically increased. But even if the application, which uh, very highly privileged permissions are uploaded to, to the Google Play Store, uh, and let's say it's successfully downloaded and installed on the device and they launched on the device. Because it's a special system permission, it is not enabled yet. Actually, the user need to go outside of the application context and, to and uh, perform some external steps in the advanced uh, system settings. Let's see the, how it works normally. Like in any case, um, first, the application declares in the manifest, but since it's a special system permission, the user needs to go externally to the advanced settings, either from the settings screen or from the shortcut from app info, like I do it here. And you can see that in that case, there is like, you know, a completely separate screen just for that, like a dedicated screen just for this particular permission for that specific application. And the user can either enable or disable it. And the Android states very clearly here, as you can see, hopefully you can read it from there, that a user needs to be aware that this is a very, very serious permission because it will allow this application to create the views above any other apps. But like I said, we're gonna bypass everything, right? So I found that exactly the same ability can be achieved by a default service called Toast. Now, Toast is a very interesting service. Originally, it was created to show just small, um, you know, text messages, like small pop-ups, um, which show, showing some small text. And it was created in the first API level. And today, like I said in the beginning of the presentation, there are 32 API levels. Means that this service is available on all API levels in Android. So if you remember that big number, three billion active devices, this service works on every one of them. So I noted that because of the nature of this service, it doesn't matter how you call it, how you invoke a uh, creation of the view with the toast, it always appear on top of everything because this is just how it works. But in addition to that, I also noticed that it can be triggered by any application with no permissions at all, as opposed completely to the special system permission that it uses. And third thing, very interesting thing, as I'd say, last but not least, right? Toast views, they don't receive focus by default. So I asked myself, is this service when I create views with that, is it really limited for a small text messages? And I found that it is not. You can actually comp uh, customize completely the views and they can show whatever you want, wherever you want. So let's see uh, this small example. The simplest Toast uh, example will look something like that. Probably Android users recognize it already. But you can also sh show images with that. You can also show videos with that. You can even load web content with a web view with that. And you can even cover the entire screen with that. So knowing that, I ask myself, OK, I can show whatever I want, wherever I want does have some limitations, but Toast has a limitation, appearance duration. You cannot, for example, say, show this Toast view for two and a half minutes. It just doesn't work this way. Instead, you need to pass one of these uh, constant values, either length short or length long. 
length short will make it appear approximately for two seconds, and length long will make it appear for approximately four seconds, and, and then it disappears. Actually, exact time uh, diff can be different uh, between different devices, but this is pretty much accurate. But this limitation can be bypassed also very easily. Simply by calling recursively again and again and again uh, with the same toast view configuration, you can, uh, as long as the delay between the calls is shorter than the appearance time, you can make it appear before it disappears. So the overlay will remain on the screen theoretically forever. Let's consider the next example. Ransomware. Blocking the screen for the user. So I created a, a small a recursive method, I call it overlay one, which uh, takes a integer count and count it down to zero with the delays of one second. As you can see, the duration is length long, which approximately four seconds. So I create the view, customized view with the resource layout file, which is this file. And I set the gravity of it to fill the screen from the origin point zero in zero. Basically, it filled the screen entirely from the top left corner. In the layout configuration, the width and height set to match parent with the background black, basically black screen completely covering uh, the entire screen of the user with a message saying, well, your screen is blocked. And if you want to unblock it, you just need to pay zero one Bitcoin, not a lot. So let's see it running. The user uses his device and overlay appear with no permissions at all. And as you can see, overlay doesn't disappear. The user can click bug button, home button, tasks button. It doesn't matter because it will always stay on top as much as we want. Cool, right? Thank you. And please notice that there are no permissions at all used. Now, creating an overlay to block the screen entirely, it's cool, but this is not the only thing we can do. If you remember the third ability of TOS, that the views, they don't receive focus by default, it means that this technique can also be used for a click jacking. And sometimes to make something crucial to happen, you just need one single click from a user. Now, according to some article I read about the um, usage uh, behavior of Android users, an average Android user uh, touched the screen for a little bit more than 2,600 times a day. And that's just an average user. So like heavily users do it more. Uh, by the way, the link uh, for that article is uh, referenced in the end of the CFP. Anyway, that makes it very hard to remember, you know, every time you tap the screen. And it makes it easy to trick the user to tap in, in the specific spot using the common alert pop-ups. I mean, think about it for a second. Let's uh, test it a little bit. Like, how many of you have Android device, let's say, for more than five or six years? Okay, with the raise of your hand. Okay, a lot of people, definitely more than half. I would say like 70%. So ask yourself, how many times in this five, six years that you have the device, how many times you have seen these alerts, right? Like, unfortunately, Google Play service has stopped. Uh, unfortunately, browser stopped. Unfortunately, application crashed, blah, 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 whatever. You can see it all the time, right? And what do you usually do? It's okay, something crashed. You click OK, and you continue with your life. You continue with your... Uh, 2,616 other tabs, right? But what if at that particular time, at one of these times, when you clicked OK button, your actual click went through this OK because the view didn't receive the focus to some other clickable element which you didn't even see? Let's consider the next example. Click Jack and POC. I created some small uh, dummy application. I called it Click Jack Victim. Uh, I used this uh, small dummy examples uh, in not real applications 
obviously to prevent potential copyright issues for me and Defcon, but as you can understand, it will also work with any other applications. So anyway, this application is very simple. You have two buttons, a no button, yes button, and here in the logs we can see uh, what exactly happened. So if the user will click no, we will see POC no, and when the user click yes, we will see POC yes. All right, very simple example. So I'm running this payload. User uh, is using his device, and then at some point, pam, some alert is popping up. Google Play services has stopped. He clicks OK, doesn't suspect anything, uses his device. But what actually happened? He was just tricked to click the POC yes. So how did it work? Well, the user saw this alert uh, pop-up, Google Play service uh, stopped, and supposedly clicked on the OK button. The actual click went to the Yes button that was exactly behind it. So what can we do with these techniques? What can be real-life expo uh, exploitations uh, with different combinations of these techniques. So first, I showed you uh, unauthorized uh, two-way communication. So we can communicate with our server, for example, for command and control, and the server can tell the Android app what to do and when to do it. For example, when uh, to block the screen for a ransomware or when to unblock it when the user paid, or which applications to disrupt on which uh, buttons to make the user to click, or which applications to uninstall. Because in Android, to uninstall a, an application, it's basically a built-in alert with just one click, and then the application is uninstalled. I mean, yeah, in the latest API levels, uh, it also needs a normal level uh, permission, but still, this is pretty simple. But also it can be used for, uh, to bypass even more permissions from dangerous protection level. Let's see some examples. Call phone permission. In Android there is a, a permission from a runtime dangerous protection level called call phone. And it protects a, a particular action. It's called action call. If you create an uh, implicit intent with action call and you give a URI with a phone number, the Android will open a dialer, it will parse the URI and put the phone number in the dialer and then it will start the phone call. But that will work only if the application has the needed call phone permission. If it doesn't have it, then as we have seen previously, security exception, it cannot work. But at the same time, in Android, there is another uh, action called action dial, which work with uh, default permissions. And it does exactly the same thing, or almost exactly the same thing. Uh, it will also trigger the dialer. It will also parse the URI, take the phone number, put in the dialer, but it will not start the phone call. That's the difference. You just need one single click from a user to start it. So you see where I'm going with it, right? So normal, normal behavior, if you're trying to access say, action call, application crashing, uh, alert, blah, 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 security exception is strong, permission denied. You cannot access ability that is protected by permissions, normally. But a combination of these uh, techniques, using the action dial, Users see some, again, some alert, clicking OK, but what actually happened, as you can see, the phone call started. And no permissions used. All right, as, as you can uh, understand, obviously I purposely removed the overlay so we can see the dialer, but like I showed previously, the overlay can remain if needed. Another example, location permissions. Now, uh, when application need to access device location, 
Look, all of the location permissions, like fine location, coarse location, etc., they are all uh, runtime permissions from a dangerous protection level. So application needs to check before it tries to access the, de the device location, need to check whether this permission uh, is given, and if not, to trigger the alert. And like I explained it previously, uh, in case of location, it will uh, trigger the alert where the user can allow this, this permission, uh, deny it, or allow it for one-time usage. But th this is how it works for normal applications, not for a browser. In the browser, when the web page is uh, executing JavaScript navigator get current position, it triggers alert from, from the browser, and with one single click, the user can uh, allow this web page to access device location. So using the first technique, with the URI of Chrome browser, we can trigger the Chrome browser to open a malicious web page that will trigger uh, the needed JavaScript navigator get current position that will make this uh, built-in alert. And then with the click jacket, we can allow the access for ourselves. So that would look something like that. User uses his device. A browser has stopped, blah, 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 clicks OK. Browser stopped. Browser restarted. Nothing suspicious. No permissions used, right? But what just happened? The device location was just stolen. All right? Thank you. And hopefully at this moment this is clear for everyone why it worked, but still. When the user saw this uh, alert and supposedly clicked on the OK button, the OK button appeared exactly above the uh, built-in uh, alert from the browser where he allowed uh, actually the permission, the, the device location for the web page. And this is how it worked. OK, that's it. Uh, I see that we still have some time. So if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them.